we um, think that you should buy copies of this book. It's only a week till Mother's Day or a little bit over a week till Mother's Day. So there possibly is still enough time to send this book directly to your mum. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Aviva Tuffield, who is here from, she's the publisher at the University of Queensland Press. Welcome, Aviva. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, firstly, I also would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunwarrung peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land from which I am Zooming down here in Victoria and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd also like to thank Chrissy Neen and the fabulous Avid Reader team for arranging this launch and for all that they are doing to support writers, publishers and readers during this time of social distancing. They deserve our loyal support in return. So consider buying a book, maybe even this one. I'm so pleased that we can celebrate Chris Flynn's wonderful new novel, Mammoth, online tonight. Chris has had a big publication week with lots of media and virtual events, and it does seem appropriate that the weather at week's end in Victoria has turned suitably Siberian in your honour, sir. <laughs> I've known Chris for a long time and have always wanted to publish his work. So when the proposal for his third novel dropped into my inbox, I was very excited. Then I opened the document and read the first lines of the synopsis, and they did give me pause. Narrated by the 13,000-year-old fossil of an American mastodon, Mammoth is the mostly true story of how the skull of a Tyrannosaurus batar, the fossilised bones of a dire wolf, a pterodactyl, a prehistoric penguin, the severed hand of an Egyptian mummy, and the narrator himself came to be on sale at a 2007 natural history auction in Manhattan. Well, I have to admit, I did think that Flynn will have to be pretty bloody good to have pulled this one off. Well, as you can see, he was, and the book is in our hands, or in my hands now, and I'm one very proud publisher of this amazing work. Mammoth is an extraordinary feat of the imagination. Not only has Chris ventriloquized all sorts of animals, nay, fossils, that we've never encountered in fiction before, but he also deals with one of the most pressing issues of our times, humanity's impact on the natural world and its consequences. This book is intriguing, insightful and moving, but it's also laugh out loud funny and uplifting and ultimately optimistic. It's a really rare combination. And once you finish reading the book and learn how deeply researched it is and how much of what you'd assume was just Chris Flynn blather is actually rooted in fact, you will be even further impressed. This book embodies the dictum that the truth is stranger than fiction. At an event on Tuesday, Christos Cholkus declared that this book was truly astonishing. And on air in an interview on Wednesday, ABC radio presenter Sarah McDonald called it fun and fabulous. And just today in, in Australian Book Review, reviewer Astrid Edwards wrote, everything about Chris Flynn's mammoth, the characters, plot and structure should not work, but it does and beautifully so. Congratulations, Chris. I just know the praise and accolades are gonna keep on coming for this novel. Before I hand over to the hominid of the moment, I just wanna pay tribute to Felicity Dunning, who was Chris's editor at UQP. Felicity tuned into Chris's strange wavelength and the two of them started channeling the different fossils' voices. And frankly, we're lucky, given they both studied drama, that they're not reenacting a scene for us online tonight. In fact, if we weren't all in various forms of lockdown, they'd probably be setting off around the country to perform the vaudevillian stage version of this book any day now. Congratulations, Chris. This book is a triumph. And this is how you um, clap in the online, in the muted online space. Hooray for Chris. Now I'd like to introduce Nick Earls, who has generously agreed to be in conversation with Chris Flynn about Mammoth tonight. Nick Earls is the author of, wait for it, I had to double check this, 27 books for adults, teenagers, and children. His writing has won awards in Australia, the UK, and the US, and appeared on bestseller lists in those countries. Five of his books have been adapted into stage plays, and two, 48 Shades of Brown and Perfect Skin, into feature films. Mm. His most recent work includes the multi-award winning novella series, Wisdom Tree, described in the Sydney Morning Herald as a triumphant and extraordinary piece of fiction. Over to you, Nick, and thank you. Thanks very much, Aviva. And um, yes, I'm one of likely to be very many people who are very glad you took the chance to publish this book. Now, at uh, Newcastle Writers' Festival three years ago, in the beer garden of a no-star hotel, Chris Flynn and I discussed our ridiculously bold ideas for our next books. 
his, I'm pleased to say, has lost none of its boldness in the execution. As a reader, if you've ever had that feeling when you pick up a book that the territory in it might have been covered before, for example, if you're thinking, I think I've read other characters in coffee shops dissecting their relationship failings, or didn't someone else go back to the rural town of their youth and solve a murder from long ago? <laughs> I'm pretty confident you won't get that feeling from Mammoth. As you've heard from Aviva, mammoth is a conversation between an extinct mammoth, a fossil tyrannosaur, a paleo penguin, an ancient Egyptian finger, and other auction items the night before they're auctioned in New York in 2007. When Chris told me he was going to write a 13,000 year old mammoth as a narrator, I had two thoughts. First, you mad bastard. And second, I really want to read that. And now thankfully I have. Uh, it's brilliant for the boldness of its concept and also for its thousands of fascinating ideas, but it's also a compelling read. And I want to know how Chris achieved that. So tonight is our chance to find out. Chris, first, I want you to tell me about two moments. The moment when you found out about the auction, uh, what did you think and what made it stick with you? And then the moment when you worked out there was a novel in it, since I don't actually know what would trigger that thought. Right. So hello, everyone. Um, and thank you to Aviva and Felicity and Nick and Chrissy. So let's get into it. Um, basically, that auction was the moment that made me realize I could turn this story into a novel because I had already been thinking about writing a story. Um, involving a mammoth um, after reading some of Thomas Jefferson's letters which shortly after he participated in the 1800 election um, about a week later in fact um, it took them a few months to count the votes back in those days so he didn't know whether he'd won until February of 1801 but um, a week after the election he was writing letters to people asking them could they get him some mammoth bones um, he was really obsessed with the mammoth and the idea of large creatures that once roamed the American plains. He basically wanted to prove to the Europeans that this new democracy was um, was going to be a success and that America wasn't this sort of damp, fetid, useless place, that it was great. It's the origin of that whole make America great thing that uh, that Trump still champions today. So I wanted to write something about... Um, Jefferson's obsession with the mammoth. And he, there were groups of hardy pioneers that did actually go out searching for mammoth bones on behalf of the president. And I started off writing the book like that. And it was a very Cormac McCarthy-esque, you know, dark story of brutal men going out into the Kentucky wilderness trying to find mammoth bones. But it ran out of steam pretty quickly. And I, I just I didn't know where to go with it. And it was also just no fun whatsoever. <laughs> um, and so I, I put it on the back burner and thought, oh, well, I'm not really sure how to do this. And it wasn't until I heard about the auction where they were selling all of these um, dinosaurs and megafauna that I, the little, a little bell went off and I thought, oh, they're still looking for these mammoth. People are still buying these bones, um, seeking these bones. And this is 200 years later. And that's when I realized, oh, maybe I can look at that period of time, um, comparing the modern day to the early 19th century and um, find a story somehow linking those two. Um, and so the, the auction was a really useful um, part of the process for me in terms of advancing the idea of a novel. It wasn't quite there yet at that point, but it was a huge help. And plus, as soon as you hear about the auction and you hear that Nicolas Cage um, bought a, the skull of the Tyrannosaurus for $276,000 just so he could put it up on his wall for no other reason, um, it seems so ridiculous to me. And he outbid Leonardo DiCaprio for the skull. Um, and then he had to give it back because it turned out to be stolen. It was like a lot of the things that were on sale at the auction. Um, they're very hard to um, for the auction house to verify the provenance and the Tyrannosaurus skull. Um, tyr tyrannosaurs are very sought after. And um, this one was, pr this particular Tyrannosaurus was from Mongolia. He's a cousin to the T-Rex. To the He's a T-Batar. 
or Tarbosaurus, as they're sometimes called. And um, he was illegally exported from Mongolia in with a shipment of coal and um, in by a, a, a dealer in Florida who ended up doing time for selling these fossils. So Nicolas Cage gave the Tyrannosaurus back and he's now back in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia today in a dinosaur museum where he belongs. Hopefully with a copy of this book now on display. <laughs> so. Well, he does have an email address, um, which is in, in the book. And I'd, I don't know what will happen if someone was to send an email to that email address. Who knows? It could be real. It could be real. I think that sounds like it's worth a try, doesn't it? Mm. I think we should give that a go. Um, so the, it started with the letters of Thomas Jefferson then. What drew you to those letters? Um, I've always been fascinated by um, the more obscure aspects of history. And I guess about 10 years ago, they released a new batch of Jefferson letters that hadn't been published before. He was a very prolific writer of correspondence. And I, I had been looking a little bit at, at the early days of the American democracy. It was a period that I was quite interested in and um, how they were. Um, it was a, a time of great change in our society um, generally around the world. Mm -hmm. um, around about 1800, um, the early part of the 19th century, um, because people didn't really, there's a lot of things people didn't know and were still trying to work out. Um, for example, how old the earth was. Mm -hmm. um, like they thought that the earth was about 6,000 years old at that time. Um, but then um, people were unearthing these bones from, from farmland and um, all over the place. And they were clearly a much older creatures than there were a lot older than 6,000. And so it was really challenging people's conceptions of um, time and humanity's place in time. And some scientists were proposing the idea that there may actually have been something that existed on the earth before us, which was a, 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 a major change in thinking at that time. Yeah. Uh, an, an age of reptiles were, great creatures once roamed the earth, but people thought this was ridiculous. And even though, even though they were digging up bones, they just didn't understand, well, what, how could these creatures have, have ruled the earth? What, what happened to them? Because at that time, people had no, had, had no clue. So this, mm -hmm. I, I just thought it was a very interesting period of history to be looking at. And the fact that uh, Jefferson himself was, was more interested in, his, in mammoth in his first year of office as president of the United States um, I guess it sort of typifies, well, I don't want to get too much into politics, but the Republican um, attitude towards um, power where, you know, you'll, you'll think about anything but governing the country. Um, yes, yes, we could go down a quite a tangent there and um, we'll try not to. So, uh, and then you've been reading these Jefferson letters and you noticed this thing about the auction and that there was a mammoth skull there. Um, you connect the mammoth skull back to the Jefferson story. Um, is that mammoth skull connected back to the Jefferson story? And, uh, and that must have been a very exciting moment, thinking I've got this new aspect to this. Well, Jefferson did eventually um, manage to secure himself a, a complete mammoth skeleton and he spent months in the White House trying to assemble it himself. He had one of the rooms in the White House with all the bones laid out. And this was, remember, in, in his first year as president, yes. and he, when he really had a lot to do. Um, and he would spend hours in there and pouring over these bones, trying to assemble them. And eventually, they, they kind of did. They weren't quite sure what it would look like. They had no frame of reference. And they initially put the tusks upside down. Um, to make it look much more fearsome. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's exactly the same mammoth that was on sale at the auction. Um, mammoth bones are turning up in great numbers at the moment because the permafrost in Siberia is melting and it's perfectly legal in Russia to pick up uh, mammoth bones off the ground just as you would berries. You don't really need any permission to do that. And of course, mammoth tusks are ivory um, and there were tens of millions of mammoths um, locked in the permafrost. So there's a lot of ivory lying on the ground in Siberia now, and um, people are killing each other to get a hold of it and sell it off to, um, to the lucrative ivory market. 
So there, you had that. You had the Jefferson letters. You had the you had the auction, and you pursued it from there. And in the book, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of quite surprising ideas. And this is the first time I think I've sat with a novel with my phone with me and not spoiled the experience by looking loads of things up. Uh, normally the phone's a distraction, but it seemed to kind of, it was a chance to kind of take something from the book and chase it further and, and see more things that were there. And uh, as, uh, as Aviva had said earlier, it's, it's quite surprising how many things in the book are actually real and not made up. In fact, so many of them are made up uh, that I couldn't actually believe it where, yeah, sorry, so many things in the book are real that I couldn't actually believe it when there was one character who was made up and I tried to track her down and kept not finding her and just thought, I must be a bit of a shit Googler after all because um, I can't find, and I thought, hang on a second, it's a novel, maybe Chris invented this person and it turned out you had uh, and I really wanted her to be real but there are so many real people in there who seem less plausible than invented people um, it's, a, it's astounding. How much of that stuff did you already know and how much of it did you, did you find along the way? Right. I, I probably didn't know very much of it um, from the beginning. I knew you have some of the historical characters, but not very much about them. Um, but the story took on a bit of a, a winding, meandering um, route once I started delving into history. As you probably know yourself, you, know, you, you can basically open up any year in history and now we've got access to the sum of all human knowledge at our fingertips yes and and you can very quickly go down a series of wikipedia whirlpools getting sucked into worlds that um uh, spiral onwards and onwards and onwards and it, it, it was a bit like that when i was researching the book i would be um uh, i'd be looking at um kentucky for example and you know trying to work out exactly what kentucky was like in the year 1800 mm -hmm. And then I would discover that um, bourbon was invented at pretty yeah. much exactly that time. And then I would discover that there was some weird preacher who helped invent bourbon and, um, and how it was all related to the French. And you end up going into these little rabbit holes. But I really love that about history. Yes. And I love that about research. And that I love the fact that you get to actually call that part of your job. Uh, mm. <laughs> some people might just think you're just kind of farting around on the internet, uh, but but if you're a writer, you actually get to call it work. It's um, that's right. It's a great thing. Do you think we're able to write different books now because of this? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I did read a lot of physical books um, because I would get to points uh, on the internet where uh, it was just repeating itself, and and I wasn't able to delve any deeper. Um, and so I would often go off and buy very obscure books that I'd seen referenced, um, usually university presses from all around the world, um, you know, quite obscure books that may be written by an academic. And I would get hold of those, read those. Often they were very entertaining, in fact, um, and inform myself as I was going along. So I would think that I would know where I was going. And then I would come up against this um, juicy little um, area of history and realize, oh shit, I've got to actually go and read 12 books now about <laughs> this little part of history before I can continue because otherwise it'll seem so shoddy. Um, so, but you know, again, as you say, a bit of an excuse for um, going on the internet and buying obscure books and um, um, I'm having a nice esoteric library to refer to. And uh, you, can, you can explain when you're sitting on the couch in an afternoon, reading a book about um, uh, American mastodons and uh, Thomas Jefferson, that there's a good reason for it. <laughs> and, uh, and of course you can, it's all tax deductible since it's for work. So, uh, so it, it works on all counts. Um, I mean, the books about bourbon were particularly difficult to get through, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but extremely tax deductible nonetheless. There's some fascinating stuff about bourbon in there. So, so you're all you've got it all covered. Um, so it's this, the research then, is this really unusual mixture of the instant gratification of the internet where you click from one link to the next and can pursue things at high speed to this process where you track an out of print book down on eBay or some secondhand source and then you wait for someone 
to wrap it in brown paper and put stamps on it and <laughs> send it to your house. Correct. Yes, yes. And the other go- glorious thing about research, um, and I'm going to bring in Felicity, my editor here, who's, who's watching tonight, is that um, she and I both really enjoyed um, uh, the edits, the, the, the whole editing section of the book. Um, a lot of authors fear edits, but I actually love it because you really get to collaborate with someone and uh, work out um, how much you need to justify what you have in there. And with historical fiction particularly, I think um, you really need to check absolutely everything. Things you wouldn't think you need to check, you do, um, particularly with regards to language. So um, she and I had good fun with the etymology of words, um, working out if um, certain words would have been in usage at, in the year 1800, and if so, who would have used them? Mm. Um, and we were constantly surprised by that because certain words or phrases you think are modern yes. um, turn out to be very old, yes. and, and other words that you think are old turn out to be quite modern. Yes, yeah. Yes, and someone's going to know, aren't they? Uh, and That's right. Yes, I can remember reading a book set in 1666 in the, uh, to do with the plague, and someone used the word grog, and because I'd been to uh, a university, uh, because I'd been to a museum that happened to explain the etymology of the word grog, and that it came from the coat of a English admiral in the 1740s, I knew the word grog couldn't exist in 1666. But I decided not to be really annoying and point that out to anyone until now. But there would be there are people who will find themselves kind of temporarily distracted from the book thinking they wouldn't have used that word so it's yeah it's great that you've provided that service and uh and i certainly can't say i noticed anything that the two of you missed in this well Um, the problem with it is that once you start doing that sort of stuff you can't help noticing it all the time so now since then every time i read a book of historical fiction i've got that those sort of e, those beady eyes on it where I'm yes. looking for mistakes almost. And I have found so many mistakes, <laughs> so many usages of, of words and objects, um, uh, you know, rifles that someone are using. And I like instantly, I like, no, no, he wouldn't have had that rifle. Not in 1854. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah. But I mean, to, to give you an example of, I've used this example a few times, but it's a good one. Um, there was a, a phrase we, one of the Irish characters uses in the book, um, hair of the dog yeah of course you know means you know when you're when you're hung over you have another drink and i had just put it in because the character was irish and i thought well i'll, I'll deal with it later whether or not that was a legitimate thing to say in 18, 1801 um and felicity and i both thought that one would, would have would have pretty much been knocked out that it would have been quite a quite a modern expression but it is not it <clears> is not it is four thousand years old Um, it goes back to um ancient syria where if you were hung over in syria affected by drink um you would make up a potion of oils um some herbs and you would take some shavings off your dog and you'd and you'd mix it together and actual hair of the dog in hair of the dog so it wasn't metaphorical and uh and it made the cut by 3800 years approximately (laughs) that's good that's good. Rock solid fact. Excellent. Were there any, were there any great ideas you wanted to include, but that you weren't able to or had to cut? Or did the form of the book mean you could include pretty much anything you wanted to? Right. It's one of those books that could have gone on forever. So yeah. um, it concentrates on the end of the Ice Age when the mammoth died. And then it jumps forward to the early part of the 19th century, really only the first few years, 1800 to 1804. Um, and then 200 years later in the modern day, at some point I had to put him in the ground again um, because otherwise it would have gone on forever. I mean, I could have gone 1805, 1806. There would have been really interesting things that happened in the world at that time, but you end up with a 5,000 page book or, you know, a, a, a book that takes place over 10 10 novels you know and I didn't I didn't want to get into that there were a few things though that I uh, I don't think Aviva or Felicity know this but um I was tempted to um have him reappear in Las Vegas in the 1950s when they were doing nuclear testing (laughs) um and I explored that avenue for a little while 
but um, it ended up getting, I decided to pull that out and that became another book entirely, which is an absolute mess. And I don't know if anyone's ever going to see that one. Um, but one of the things we did definitely cut was um, we had original source documents um, included at the start of each section. So there was uh, excerpts from one of Jefferson's books. Mm -hmm. There were excerpts from diaries that pioneers um, kept at that time. Um, and this was to try and give it a bit of um, verisimilitude, but um, Aviva correctly uh, said that it was breaking up the rhythm of the book, breaking up the mammoth's voice too much. So we pushed them to the end of the book in a, an appendix. And then they ended up just sort of hanging off the end of the book a bit uselessly. So we just took them out altogether. Maybe you can, can you make them available online or something like that? They're all out of yeah. copyright, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. We could do if anyone's interested in uh, oh, going back to the source documents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, while you went around doing your combo of um, 21st century and 19th century research uh, with, uh, with all the Googling and all the, all the old books that were arriving, what were some of the biggest surprises that came along? Right, yes, that's a good question. Um, I think there's two big surprises that came out of researching the book for me. Um, one was the Egyptian pharaoh who, who you mentioned earlier. Um, there was the hand of an Egyptian mummy on sale at the auction. And um, I've, wh whether it was the pharaoh hatship suit or not, we're not quite sure. But um, I found out about this pharaoh um, hatship suit who was um, one of very few female pharaohs in ancient Egypt. And she was one of the greatest pharaohs that they ever had. She did a tremendous amount of... Um, of nation building in Egypt um, and um, a lot of in international trade deals that she sorted out at that time. And she was by all accounts, one of the best pharaohs that they'd ever had, but is, but is a character who's kind of lost to history a little bit, certainly not given the same, um, the same shout as uh, all the male pharaohs. And some historians believe she was the first great woman of history that we um, actually know something about. Um, but she's not a character who appears very often uh, in, in, in any books. So that was amazing finding out about her. Um, there's a whole other book to be written about her, no doubt. Um, and the other thing I enjoyed finding out was, and was alarmed to find out, was that um, the Nazis um, had explored the world trying to um, collect supernatural relics. So the penguin in the story talks about the Nazis, um, and so does the pterodactyl who was from Germany. Um, yeah, the Nazis were in the Antarctic. They were in Central and South America. They were in the Himalayas. They, uh, there was a branch of the SS who actively were out there trying to, trying to investigate the occult and collect um, powerful supernatural, supposedly powerful supernatural relics, essentially to use them as potential weapons. And I thought that was an amazing thing. I didn't know that at all. Yes, I didn't know that at all either. That was amazing. So, of course, that was one of the things I had to Google going, is Chris just, you know, bullshitting me here or is this the real deal? And, yeah, so, you know, when you read the things like that actually happen, of course you believe the rest of it um, and all the characters. Uh, so coming up with all of this stuff, this amazing stuff, at some point you had to write a novel and at some point you had to decide on the structure of that novel so that it would work as a story. How did you decide on the structure entering the story the night before the auction and structuring it as a conversation, centering on a mammoth, telling its frequently interrupted post-life story? Yes, the structure question. Yes, that's a hard one to answer. Um, I don't think that I, it's probably a huge feeling in me as a, as a writer, but I am terrible at structuring things um, beforehand. Um, I'm not very good at um, planning things out and saying, okay, I'm going to have 20 chapters. They're each going to be, you know, 3000 words. And, th and this is what, what will happen in each one. I, unfortunately, I cannot make, make my brain work in that linear fashion. So, so when it comes to planning books, that's, I, I think the people who plan books don't actually plan them that way. They don't start from the point of view of oh. working out the number of chapters and how many words. So we'll, we'll have to have a chat about that sometime. Oh, okay. I thought that's what, how you're supposed to do it, but <laughs> <laughs> obviously, uh, good, good. That, that's good news. Yes, um, really but now yeah. tell, yeah, so tell us what you did. Tell us how you, how you found the structure. 
Well, I, I, I knew it had to be, there had to be some sections um, set in 1800. And initially I thought, well, the mammoth is in the present day, roughly 2007. So he's going to tell the story of how he was dug up and how he wound up at the auction. And I just finally was brave enough to sit down one day and think, okay, I'm going to um, write a few words of this and see, see what it sounds like. And the first um, four pages of the book were the mammoths talking about um, deep time and, um, and the first time he ever killed a, a man. That was the very first thing I wrote in the book. Um, it was about a thousand words and it just flowed out of me very quickly and very easily. And basically those thousand words informed the structure of the book because I, I, I was quite surprised when I saw them and I, I thought, okay, well, that seems quite a nice voice. And, uh, yeah. and, and he's sort of just starting right in the middle of something here and he's standing in the auction room. And then I started to think about the other creatures in the auction room and would they be in conversation with him? So it just sort of flowed from there. And the structure really took like a winding, hazy sort of road. And I was just trying to keep up with the structure as it went along. Um, so it's an unusually structured book probably, but that's because it, it, there was a certain chaos to the structuring of it. I kind of let the, ironically, let the mammoth structure the book um, in the way that he wanted to tell the story. Um, yeah, um, but that, that makes sense to me because, I mean, I think you could have spent... You could have spent a year experimenting with a whole range of different structural approaches here. But mm. if the mammoth, if when you're playing around with the mammoth, the mammoth starts telling a story and that feels like a strength, then that's something you can build on. And that's, that's what you did. So, yeah. And also, he's an, he's an oral storyteller. Yeah. The whole book is written as a, a sort of an oral account. And probably frustratingly for some people, there are no speech marks. Um, so the characters are talking to each other and you have to try and keep up with who's talking to whom. Um, but that's because it's essentially an, uh, an oral account, the whole story. It's a, it's a mammoth memoir and he's, and he's telling you his yes. story and, and he has a tendency, the, the character to go off on little, um, side jaunts and go down alleyways and, and, um, and diversions. He, if, if there's a diversion to be had, he'll take it because he loves to ramble on. Um, and, and so it sort of worked in that sense because you're following like us, we're Irish. And whenever we tell a story, we'll, you know, it'll, it'll last half an hour. You daren't ask an open-ended question of an Irishman because um, <laughs> you'll be there for a while. <laughs> yes. And the mammoth, the mammoth is 13,000 years old and, and has been alone for much of that time. Mm. I think anyone I know who's 13,000 years old and spends most of their time alone uh, is going to be a fairly digressive storyteller and leave no tangent untraveled. So I think it's I all... Think, I think by the end of restrictions in Australia, Nick, we will all feel like we're 13,000 <laughs> years we're, old and we're, we're all well. going to go on long rambling rants to each other as soon as we see each other again. <laughs> We just we have to look, we have to remember to be good listeners as well as good talkers. That's not always. <laughs> um, I've got one more question for you, Chris, and then I think we might open it up for questions from uh, from other people. So everyone, get your questions ready. Before I ask my question, uh, I want to say, looking at all these little screens of people in front of me, I want to say, nice work, Joe Duck, for bringing a mammoth along to the conversation tonight. Ooh. If anyone can see Joe's screen, yes, there's a mammoth there participating in this conversation very oh, nice there she is yes um joe incidentally is the photographer who took my took my photograph for the book so she's she's amazing that photograph of you actually like smiling and not looking hardcore yeah correct she managed <laughs> to get a smile out of me <laughs> <laughs> it's the first photo i've seen like that i thought who, who is that guy um <laughs> so my last question um to go beyond the story itself it actually says things about us and what we do to the planet. When did you decide a 13,000 year old mammoth skull was an opportunity to talk about the conduct of humans? Um, pretty early on, really. Um, he's got a pretty low opinion of the hominids as our mammoth, um, and rightly so. Um, I was working at the RSPCA for five years um, whilst I was writing this. and um, 
I became, I was working in the isolation unit with uh, sick and injured animals who are in recovery. So you get to spend quite a lot of time with them. And I became very aware of their internal lives and the way that they would communicate with each other and with us. And any pet owner will tell you, you know, their animals are always communicating with them. So the idea of interspecies communication became very apparent to me. And the idea also that um, we are being observed by the animals. Um, because I would have all these animal eyes staring at me every day at work. Um, so that made me think in those sort of terms of having this 13,000 year old creature who had a very interesting perspective on humanity. And of course, from the mammoth perspective, they are, they have a very unique perspective on us because we killed them all. We literally turned up where they lived and we killed every last one of them, tens of millions of them. Mm. And they were keeping the earth nice and cool because they were walking around the steppe that encircled the north of the world, compacting the snow, keeping everything nice and cold. And then we killed them all, ate them all, um, used their fur and their tusks for our own purposes. And then the earth started to get warm. <laughs> um, and now, of course, ironically, those, same, those very same creatures that we killed, some of them probably even have spear wounds, mm. are thawing out of the Siberian permafrost. Mm. And they're very well-preserved specimens with viable DNA. And there are several teams around the world, one in Harvard and one in South Korea, who are working on cloning those mammoth back to life with the idea, believe it or not, of recreating a herd and releasing them in rewilded parts of Siberia to stomp everything down again yeah. and try to restore the permafrost. <clears throat> so it's the very exact creatures that we killed who might actually end up saving our arse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, while at the same time, perhaps we burn less coal and things like that too. Well, that's right. Uh, uh, yes, uh, bring the mammoths back as well and let them do, let them do their bit. Wouldn't that let be them great? Do the thing. Uh, yeah. The, the, we, we'll go to other people's questions in a moment, but um, at the beginning of, of that answer there, when you were talking about your experience looking after the animals uh, and the animals together and kind of communicating with, it, with each other and looking at you, that felt to me a bit like the night before the auction uh, with all these, with the, uh, the fossilized animal parts all together. Uh, it was a bit like that RSPCA room of yours where there are some animals that didn't expect to be in the same place, but sort mm. of making the best of it and connecting with each other. Maybe that's where it came from. You know, you might be onto something there. I, I didn't really think about that, but maybe that's where it came from. Cause I, I would literally spend eight hours on my feet in this single big room, um, full of, uh, we didn't really like calling them cages, but like pens where they, where they sick animals were. And I would have to go around and read their charts and interact with them all for 15 or 20 minutes sometimes each and um um so yeah maybe that's where it came from um and so i just became that person who's standing in the auction room suddenly able to hear the voices of the creatures yes and um and letting them channel their stories through me it's a, yes. it's, a, it's a nice thought yeah. it is so let's go with that thought chrissy how are we going with questions we have a few questions from the audience actually um so the first one is from vikram uh, who notices that there's another book um, by Robert Backer um, called Raptor Red, which is told from the Velociraptor's perspective. And um, so he wants to know if you um, ha have come across that, Chris, at all. What's the name of the book? It is called Raptor Red. No, I have not. Is it, a, is it from, written from the point of view of a raptor? Yeah, of the Velociraptor. Oh, that sounds good. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get that. Definitely, that sounds good. No, I don't know about that. Thank you for the recommendation. <laughs> so, um, that was, so we'll take that as a comment, since you didn't know it. Um, there's also Natalie has asked, how long did it take to write um, with all the research that you had to do? And what was your daily writing routine? Right. That's, a, that's kind of the biggest question in the world really um the it took six years in total 
from the conception of the idea um, to coming up with a finished draft. Um, what percentage of that was actual writing is pretty hard to know. Um, I did come at it from a few different angles, uh, tried a few different ways that it wasn't working. Um, I would spend quite long periods where I had maybe written a few thousand words and then I would come up against a brick wall where I realized I needed to go and spend a few months um, reading a bit more deeply. Um, so it was a bit of an off and on process over six years, a mixture of constant research whilst I was writing. There was no, it wasn't like I just did all my research and then stopped and then wrote the thing. It was constant back and forth. It, it felt very messy at the time and I, I didn't really know if, where it was all going and whether it was all going to come together. So it was quite a surprise to me when it all finally started to fall into place. As to my writing routine, uh, I have the worst writing routine. I'm probably the worst person to ask that question to. Um, mm -hmm. I have the smallest, although it's quite bright where I'm sitting now because I have all the lights on, um, I have the smallest and darkest room in the house. I chose that room on purpose. So I would spend as little time in here as possible. Um, I, I come in, I get a few hours work done and then I get out. I would much rather be outside walking around thinking about writing than actually sitting at my keyboard doing the writing. For me, the actual writing bit is probably the, it's probably heresy to say this, it's kind of the least interesting part for me. I, I enjoy the research and I enjoy the edits um, because once you have a manuscript, then you're off to the races. You know, you can basically do anything with it. And I'm not very precious. Um, so if, I mean, Felicity didn't um, put a red pen through thousands of words, but if she had and said, oh no, that's not working, I would have just gone, oh, okay, let's forget it. And, and let's move on and do something else. I'm a pretty easy um, writer to edit. So I enjoy that part. I guess maybe because I enjoy the collaboration more than I enjoy being on my own. Wow. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm the pole opposite to you, by the way, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Edit and the research. Oh my God. Um, so there's a question here um, from Paula um, who asks, you know, that that voice of the mammoth came so easily to you. Um, and do you still have that voice in your head? Does that, um, do you find that that voice takes over your own voice sometimes or you see him in his voice? That's a good question. And no one has asked me that yet. Um, so I have an answer for it though. Um, I have not thought about the mammoth at all. Um, he hasn't been in my head at all for quite a while. And then this week, um, it's coincidentally is publication week. Uh, I have been asked by the radio national science show to, um, write a small piece that I will read on air for them. Um, but they made a very unusual quirky request where they want me to um, imagine myself sitting on, on the cliffs on Phillip Island where I live, watching the penguin colony, and I um, start to hear the mammoth again. So for the first time this week, I actually started to think again in the mammoth's voice, um, and I had to pull out of it pretty quickly because I suddenly he was there. And I started writing this piece in the mammoth's voice and, and, and I, I got a bit freaked out and I, and it was the first time I thought, Oh, I can still access the mammoth. That's, that's a bit of a surprise. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, yeah, he's in there, I guess from a writer's perspective, you, you kind of feel like an undiagnosed schizophrenic sometimes as a writer with, um, thousands of voices in your head all clamoring for attention and um, that can be a little bit disturbing at times <laughs> so you have to try and make the voices be quiet for a little while so you can get on with your life but I think she's right the mammoth probably is still in there ready to re-emerge um, if he if he needs if we need him is he going to invade your next book um in a very oblique fashion I haven't talked too much about the next book. I've made a few hints. Felicity knows um, uh, and is excited, I think. But um, yes, he, the next book will make a reference to the mammoth, um, but it's only a, a starting point um, for something um, that will be set um, 
quite a while ago. And well, yes, I'm not going to say anything more. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. Well, somebody here, actually, um, Joe, Joe Duck wants you to um, write the book about the atomic testing in the 50s. Please make that book, says Joe. Um, and um, also uh, says, do you ever hear the voice of the characters from your older books in your head or is it just the memory? Um, the atomic testing book, Joe, is actually done, but um, I haven't shown it to uh, anyone except for my agent and publisher, Brendan, and he loves it, but I'm not sure about it. So um, I don't know if we'll go any further with that. Um, but um, do I hear the voices of the old characters? Not really. I mean, the voice, the character in my first book, mm. he was a bit of a Northern Irish thug, and I know Nick is a, uh, an old fan of him. And yeah. is always looking for him to come back. But um, I know where he is now. That's the interesting thing. The character where we leave him in that first book, I know what happened to him next. I've never written it, but I, if I was to ever go back to him, it would be five years later and he'd be living in New York and he'd be a, a, a budding fashion model. <laughs> I probably I could, I, I probably I could slip into his voice again, but oh, again, it's, it's like asking an actor to revisit an old role and um, sometimes you don't want to go back there. Um, so there's also a question here from uh, someone who I don't know the name of who says, um, what advice would you have for young writers starting out at the moment? Oh, um, yes, that is a good question. I should have really prepared for that question, shouldn't I? Um, all right, so... When I was, I'm, I'm 48 years old and my first book was published when I was 42. Well, a week before my 42nd birthday, which was good for me because the average age of the first time novelist, believe it or not, is 42. Um, so most people don't usually get their break as a novelist until they're a little bit older. Um, that doesn't mean, and it's, you know, when someone does get a break a bit younger, usually it gets a bit of publicity. So it's easy to feel that it's happening to people when they're very young, but it's actually quite rare. Um, and um, so when you're young as a writer, I think the secret is persistence and um, living. So I'm all for living a full life when you're young and um, gathering the experiences and the people that you meet and the places that you go and um, if you've got that writerly urge, if you've got that in your DNA, then that's all grist for the mill. You know, you, well, you, you may take years to process that stuff that happens to you, but it could eventually come out um, in your work. And it might be years later. Um, so there's no need to rush into it. Um, when I was young myself, someone gave me some good advice and said, um, don't worry about being a writer yet. Just go and live. And that's pretty much what I did, probably to my detriment, but um, <laughs> um, because I didn't publish my first novel till I was 42. But um, yes, I would say, enjoy your life and don't put too much pressure on yourself to be published um, at a young age. Um, you've got plenty of time for that. But by the time you're my age, we'll all be living till we're 150. Of course, there's a lot of writers out there who are saying that they having trouble writing in the current situation mm. that we're in right now and um that's probably wise words to writers working at the moment is not to put pressure on yourself to achieve things just because you're isolated um, totally um, i think just because we have time doesn't mean we have the um the will time itself is not enough you need to be able to have the right mindset and sometimes having all the time in the world might seem good for writing is, but it is not and I, I wouldn't put I wouldn't I would say no one should really be down on themselves if they're not being creative at the moment it's, there's plenty of other things to think about True. there's um, one last question here which is um, that the banter and dialogue between the characters is really funny did you enjoy writing that did that come easily is it hard to write funny ah is it hard to write funny I, I don't know if it is I mean it probably is but I don't know um, that's the way I live. And I, and I actually think that's the way most people live. Um, in Ireland, you're constantly, constantly with your friends, um, tearing strips off each other, being like, really mean to each other. 
Um, and I see one of my old friends, um, George, is George Houghton and his wife Benita are online tonight, and they're, they're probably in Ireland right now. Um, and George and I met on a rooftop and instantly started taking the piss out of each other because that's how we are. And I think Australians are like that too, to be honest. I think Australians are very good at banter and um, bouncing off each other. And I'm kind of surprised it doesn't appear a bit more in Australian writing. Um, I'd like to see more of that. And I kind of love that idea of having a group of people, all or fossils in this case, um, uh, just going at each other and um, talking about things that an annoy them, the things that irritate them, how they don't like each other. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I really enjoyed writing that. And I can't write any other way, unfortunately. And um, I'll probably never win one of those big serious um, book awards because I can never really be that serious. Look, I think at the moment, um, as a bookseller, I, I know that people are wanting books that are funny. Like this is a time when you are, you either want to dive into the depths and read, you know, The Plague by Camus, or you want to read something that's going to make you laugh. And so if you're one of those people who just wants to have a laugh and um, take your mind off this 24-hour news cycle, this is probably the book for you or for your mum, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> this actually might be a time to share that link with you one more time. So the link coming up on the screen is a link to purchasing um, a copy of the book or one for you and one for mum. And um, I, I think that's the time of the evening where um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. It's been really fantastic. Um, if you have any final um, comment, Chris, now's the time to do it before I unmute people for their final clap. Oh, yes. I, I would like to say something, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, I could go and thank a million different people, but um, I wanted to also pay tribute to Felicity, um, who is um, probably, no, I'm not even saying probably, it's definitely the, the best editor working in Australia today. And UQP are very lucky to have her. And um, she's been an amazing influence on the book and has not all of the jokes in the book are mine. There's a couple of Felicity's jokes in there too that are, that are, that are top notch. Um, and also Aviva. If I could just mention Aviva, um, Aviva Tuffield. So she's made a tremendous impact on Australian literature with all the writers that she's nurtured and published and particularly women and indigenous authors. We all know that Aviva was the co-author or the co-founder of the Stella Prize. And there's some things people probably don't know about her that um, she went to Oxford, she went to Harvard, she went to Stanford. So she's easily, easily, the smartest person I know. Is that um, got kicked out of each of those though, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. She was kicked out of them all, um, but at least she went so she can put them on her bio. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very grateful to be finally working with the, with the, with the smartest person in Australia. And I think Tuffield for, Tuffield for PM is my, um, is my cry. Um, so thank you all very much for coming and listening to this uh, dirt poor um un uneducated excuse for an irish artist um talk about his new book <laughs> thanks so much chris that's it's a fantastic night um it's been really fantastic um we can also enjoy it all later with we're starting a youtube channel that we'll be able to put this up on um, and please feel free to um to give us an actual proper round of applause now as i unmute you all and um and then you can have a clap. So if I can work out how to unmute you all, there we go. Yay! That's Chris. Hey! Thank you. 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 Brilliant, brilliant. It's amazing. Where is it? And now we're all at this point of the evening where we're milling around, a uh, glass of wine in the hand, not really sure what whether we should leave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> stop it. Cheers. Friday night, though. Yes. Cheers. Uh, cheers. Thank you. Bye. So you should be signing books, Chris. Well, you should, should be signing be books. Yeah. You should be signing books, you're right. Also, you shouldn't believe everything you read on LinkedIn, but we'll we'll talk about that later. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is that your fake LinkedIn profile? Is it? You got it. <laughs>
<laughs> that was how you got this job, was it? <laughs> I'm going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, all later.